let me introduce Jennifer. So uh, I think it was Eric who said uh, um, earlier, uh, you've probably seen Jennifer quite a bit on the uh, Commotion Labs uh, videos that uh, um, events that we did in the chat window. Uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago, I, I decided I wanted to understand what was going on with electronics manufacturing here. Um, and uh, one of the first people that I met was Jennifer. And uh, um, I've learned a lot about uh, what's going on with electronics manufacturing here. Uh, she seems to know everyone, uh, not just in Washington, but the whole Pacific Northwest, and uh, um, is a very good resource if, uh, if you're building a uh, any kind of connected product um, and need to connect with uh, um, contract manufacturers or even uh, um, get things like batteries. Uh, so uh, with that, Jennifer, uh, do you want to introduce yourself and then uh, um, introduce Harry and uh, we'll, we'll get going. Sure, sure. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm Jennifer Eby and I'm in the Seattle area, um, actually in Mill Creek, Washington. And um, I, as I started to say before everybody got on, I love a new product introduction and helping hardware um, companies with development. And we do a lot of quick turn PCBs, um, flux, rigid flux, batteries, plastic. So we're manufacturers, so we do a lot of different products. But in the fact that I have, we, we, my team has so many, we have so many different products that we do. We just know so many different people. Um, and uh, we've been working with PhD Energy now for, I think we're going on, losing track of time, but I think it's three years, could be almost four. Uh, Harry uh, Mkhitaryan is one of the partners and founders of PhD Energy, and um, they are not just a manufacturer of batteries, but PhD Energy is a solution um, provider for uh, custom batteries and cells and packs and such. Um, in the consumer space, medical, industrial, all over the place. So uh, Harry has uh, brought his knowledge with us today. He has an extensive background in manufacturing and hardware, run many projects and helped with development um, in the US, as well as his experience of living, living in China for 10 years and also doing development work in China for probably many more. So, uh, so Harry has agreed to uh, come and talk to us about different technologies, um, you know, how to help with a, a development project and the questions you need to ask and feel free to ask questions. Um, however, Harry wants to do that. Harry and I'll let you talk about how you want to manage that, um, but we'll take definitely questions at the end and um, my information, you know, reach out to me if you need anything. Uh, we have our MarkTech2 team on the call too. We have a couple people in Oregon, two in Washington and one person in Northern California. So we're here to help. Whatever that looks yeah. like, um, love to connect with people. So okay. go for it, Harry. Thank you. So as I was stated earlier, Harry Mkhitaryan, and uh, um, they gave enough information. And I'll go through the presentation and give you a little bit more about, you know, the company and myself and my partner and go over, you know, discussion. I would say the best way is, you know, the question is going to come up as I'm going through these uh, points. I guess just pose your questions on the chat and then I'll go through them, you know, one by one. Otherwise, I think if we interrupt, then this is going to get really extended, you know, and I don't want to have anybody over, you know, I don't want this to run over, you know, the time period for everybody. So I'll go through this. It's not really that big. I tr tried to make this short and sweet. You know, we're not going to go into details today. It's just give you guys good bullet points that you can use in your process of thinking through. And, you know, like I said, I'm happy to go through the chats and answer questions or we can you can contact me. I posted my email, you know, more than welcome to send me an email, you know, down the line and we can take care of that, you know, outside of this time limited scope today. So I'll get started uh, right now. Um, obviously, PhD Energy is our company. And um, as it states here, we're battery specialists. Um, let me screen through. And this basically tells you what we do. You know, we specialize in solutions. That's kind of what we do. We don't make sales. We don't make, you know, individual little sales, but we specialize in solutions. Our, you know, our, I, what, when you come to us with a problem, we'll come back to you and tell you what's the best type of solution that works for you, whether the cell, certain type of cell, certain type of pack, you know, how we can help you design it, how you should be utilizing it. 
And that's really what we do. And you know, our big mar our markets are US and Europe. That's those are the big markets that we support today. Michael, our part, our founder, you know, he might, you know, he got his PhD in lithium technology from China. He worked with Dr. Goodenough, who is the inventor of lithium batteries uh, for about four years, um, then started doing his own work and then established PhD, obviously, in 2013. Uh, I'm the co-founder with the company. Uh, I come from, Michael comes from the technology side of the batteries, you know, side business. I come from the application side of it, right? So I've done a lot of manufacturing, designing, developing, testing. I've been in the battery business way, way, way back. You know, you can see, you know, set up, you know, the standard 1725 standard. I was a member of the team that wrote that standard, which is the basis pretty much today for all the safety standards that are out there. Um, and again, done power supplies, a few other products, RF and audio stuff. So I'm very versed on, on design and set up a couple of factories in China and familiar with manufacturing process. So I bring in the application side, design side help. Michael brings in the technology side of the help. So between the two of us really, we're able to provide to the point solutions to customers, right? Without having to run around and you know talking to 10 different factories and decide, is this, is this right? Is that right for me? What is right? What is not right for my application? And that's why we say one-stop solution. And this gives you a little bit about what we're providing today. Primary batteries, rechargeable batteries and packs from simple single cell packs to you know, complex packs that involve a lot of smarts. Okay, so having said that, we're done with the marketing spiel so we can get into the, you know, the, the, the main thing. And I, I wanted to start um, basically walking you guys through, you know, what, how does the design work, right? What are we, you know, everybody, everybody here works and done th through the design and I'm not here, you know, my plan is not to go through, show you guys how you do design, but focus just on when you're doing design, how do you, where do you bring in the battery part of it into your formula, right? Where do you start? What are the questions you need to ask? What do you need to know? What do you need to do so that you can run through your design and have a successful product at the end that has battery implemented into it. So what I'm gonna do, this is a typical, you know, on the left side is your typical process of going through development, right? You're, you're brainstorming, you got whatever, as many people, say one person or 10 people in the company, you're brainstorming your product and then you create your industrial designs from that. You know, you get your concepts going done, your management approves it, then you start doing electrical designs setting electrical parameters, running EVT boards, mechanical design, doing DVTs, PVT certs, and mass production. So this is a basic, you know, very bare bones type of process, right, for developing a product. Now, if we go and we're doing a product that's portable power design, where you have a battery in it, you start the same way, but then you need to really start going, defining these here, you know, define your power environmental requirements, right? because that's gonna drive your battery selection. And you need to have a battery selection done before you really do any industrial designs. And I've seen this happen a lot with companies where they do, they try to do this like at, at the electrical design stage, right? And now they go back, well, and they say, yeah, they go online and find a battery. Oh, yeah, you know what? This X, Y, Z, this looks like I could use this kind of battery in my design. It'll fit. And then they finalize all the design. Management signs off. Sometimes they go into tools. They make tools. And they come to us and say, hey, guys, we're looking for this kind of battery. And then we look at the numbers. We say, you know, you're not going to, capacity won't fit, right? You're not going to get enough capacity or energy to fit your application. Where they're like, but we're stuck. You know, it's got to fit in the space. Well, you know, I'm not a magician, right? I'm going to bring you the, what the physics allow me to do is what I'm going to be able to bring to you to the table. I don't create. We can work with you on, on the different types of chemistries or options, higher energy densities, you know, higher light, depending on what your requirements are, but we're not going to do magic, right? We can't make something fit that doesn't fit. So it's very important that in this process, you define your batteries first because that's going to drive 
you know, not only your physical constraints, but your operating, right? It's going to drive how long is your product going to work? You know, how is what kind of environment? And and I put the, this slide here, right? In terms of what is your what drives your battery selection? And you could see, you know, size limitations, right? How big it's going to drive how big your product going to be, right? If you work backwards, then it's going to then you limit the size of the battery that may not fit your application, right? And the vice versa, the battery size will decide your battery, your product's design as well, right? You're gonna realize, oh, you know what? This curvature, I can't fit the battery I need into that curvature. Maybe I need to adjust my curvature or change the shape so I can fit this battery that I have in with me that fits. The operating temperature range, where are you gonna use this, right? Is, is this, what kind of temperature, operating temperature range requirements do you have? That's gonna drive the selection of the chemistry that we bring into the table for you. Different chemistries have different operating temperature ranges and different performances. So we need to know that, we need to understand your you know, temperature range, operating temperature range, your voltage range, your system voltage range, right? That's gonna tell us, again, chemistry as well as the configuration, right? Are, are you gonna be able to get away with a single cell solution or are we gonna need a multi-cell solution, right? Or Maybe possibly even use a booster, step up voltage regulator or step down voltage, depending, obviously depending on your system voltage, right? But to select the right booster, you need to know what the battery is gonna deliver to you in terms of the voltage range, right? And that's gonna, you know, that's gonna factor in into you selecting the right kind of booster, voltage booster or a step down. So that's important, useful life. And what I mean by that is not necessarily cycle lives only, but you know, is this product expect shelf life of the product, right? You're gonna, sometimes products are made and they sit on the shelf for six months before they're used. And then you say, you know what? My customer wants to have this be out there in the field for five years, 10 years, or two years, whatever that is, that's irrespective of the cycle life, right? You can have five cycles on certain projects or products for in 10 years. Other times you have five cycles within the five hours, right? So. The useful life versus cycle life are completely two different things. And we need to know both to make, again, the right selection of the battery chemistry for you, right? And, and that's, that's a critical information. Load currents, you know, are you getting a nice, stable, constant current? Or do you have pulses? If you have pulses, what are your pulses? You know, that's going to affect certain chemistries don't behave well, high pulses, certain chemistries do well. You know, if we're going to design the battery management system for you, the BMS or the PCM protection module, we need to know these things, right? So that we're, you know, whatever MOSFETs we're putting on there, whatever, you know, fuses should be able to handle those, those load currents that you have repetitive, especially if they're repetitive and going to happen frequently. Um, assembly process. How do you plan to assemble this product, right? You really, even though this is early stages, but you really need to think about this, you know, Different batteries have different ways of being assembled. And you got to think about how I'm going to incorporate this into my design. How is it going to attach to my board? How is, you know, where's, you know, is it going to see, you know, what kind of forces are going to see? Is it going to be bent? Is it going to be twisted? I mean, those are all things that need to be accounted for. And the right battery will make a difference, right? Do we need to give you a shape battery that conforms to the, the physical curvatures of your product? So it doesn't, you know, you don't exert unnatural forces on it or, can you get away with a flat prismatic cell, for example, or does it need to be a cylindrical cell? There's so many options today out there in terms of the size and the shape of the battery. And then the connection method that, you know, we need, you need to think about this early on because I've seen this happen where even a shaped battery, you know, you put it together and then you realize, wait a second, how am I gonna connect, you know, from the battery tabs to my board? I don't have a way to these things. They're not, you know, they're at such an angle that it's impossible for me to connect them repeatedly or reliably. Right. And that creates manufacturing issue for you down the line. So hey, Harry. you need to think through this. Yes, Jen. Excuse me. Can you know, I've had a couple of people that have texted me asking if you could expand the screen into presentation mode so they could see it a little bit more clearly. Is um, that possible I'm, to do in your format? It's let me see. I know there's a reason you're probably not doing that, but um, people have just, I've gotten a couple of text messages asking. Sure, sure. Let me see. Um, Can you put it into presentation mode or will let, you do I that? Try, let me see. I'm, I'm going to lose the, yeah, I'm going to lose the. Um, okay. If you can't, that's okay. Just do what you can. Let's see. Sorry for interrupting. 
Let me do this. No problem. No problem. Is that better? No, we can't see your screen now. You can't see my screen. All right. Yeah. See. <laughs> Sorry. My, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, it's on my. Unfortunately, it's not on my. It's okay. I can do presentation, but when I'm doing, okay, let's see. No, not this one. Yeah, it's not allowing me to do much with my. That's okay. No. I'll try to make that's about that as helps. large as I can go before. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, that's good. So we're you know, again. So and then certification, right? What kind of certifications is your end product going to need? You know, that's going to derive what certification the battery is going to going to require, right? You've got you got medical products, you got consumer products, you got automotive products, and a bunch of other stuff. And for each industry, there's certain certain certs that if you take that, it'll tell you if you're using a battery, your battery has to be certified under these guidelines. And those are important because, you know, how we design the battery and then also what we quote to you needs, we need to know that upfront and you need to know that upfront because they cost money. Some of these certs are expensive. You know, some are fairly reasonable, but some are expensive and time consuming. You know, not only it affects your cost or the design, but also affects the schedule. Some of these certs take 10 weeks certification. So I've had customers come and say, oh, I'm in a rush. I need to get this out, you know, in mass production in two months. Well, the certs alone, 10 weeks. So you're not right away if you need the certs. That throws you out right there, right? So, so you need to make a hard decision. But if you do this up front, you go into your project knowing, you know, all the requirements, all these parameters and not be stuck with this trade-off decision that nobody would like, right? And, and it's at that point, you know, everybody looks at, it, you know, what's the cost versus the deliveries of, of products. You're gonna make a compromise, I guarantee you, because 80 or 90% of the time, we will not be able to find you, for you to get lucky and not for me to find something last minute that is off the shelf that can meet all your requirements. You know, 80, 90% of the time, you're gonna make a compromise you don't wanna do. So, and you know, application kind of these to go together. Application drives the certification, but you know, it's good for us to know the application because that also helps us understand better, you know, what worked in the past, right? So we can bring you solutions from other clients, similar similar clients that have what they've done that worked, and we can tell you, you know, what we've done. This kind of solution works for you, obviously without violating NDAs and things like that. There's, you know, not everything is is. Um, is proprietary. There's certain things that we do and ways we provide solutions that are not proprietary to customers and certain things that are. What's proprietary is proprietary. You, that's part of your design. We share information that's basically non-proprietary information. We say this helped, this worked in, in, in this kind of, let's say, for example, medical industry. We know you got to deal with this certification or you got to deal with this kind of environment. This kind of solution works well in these kind of environments. Now, of course, then we fine tune that to your specific needs. So it helps for us to understand basically what is your application. So this kind of gives you a good view of, of what questions, what to think, you know, up front, you know, before you start really designing, you know, the electrical or mechanical of your product, sort out what your battery needs gonna be. Cause that's gonna, I guarantee you, it's gonna save you a lot of headaches you know, down the line. It's gonna save you a lot of scheduling on your product and cost because if you do this upfront, you're gonna get the optimum cost for your for your product. And, but if you don't do that, you won't, right? And you could see if you do this, the outcome of this battery selection process, obviously we're gonna find the best chemistry for your project, the best fit, then the battery structure, what works best. Is it going to be a prismatic? Is it going to be a cylindrical solution, coin cell, you know, shape battery? What's what works best for you? That it's going to drive that. It's going to drive the parameters for the BMS and the PCM modules. These are a protection module, right? Are you going to need a smart BMS or are you going to need just a basic dumb BMS that does, you know, your over voltage, under voltage, all the basic protection things, right? Or you can need something a little bit more smarter. It they need to do a lot of things. Um, your battery pack or cell configuration, you know, 
form factor of the pack, right? Are we, you know, if we're doing, let's say, a four cell configuration, do you need four cells side by side or a, a cube shape or, you know, all our triangular shape? What, what, what shape, what form factor is going to work for you, you know, to fit into your design? It's going to drive that. And then I put this in red cost estimates, right? You're going to get the best cost estimate at that point, right? You're going to be able to cost out your battery pack or battery system up front and, and know that you're going to get a fairly accurate pricing. And it's going to be an optimum costing at this point, you know, versus you do this down the line again, there's a high risk. You're going to overpay most likely or compromise. You know, you say, yeah, my budget is, you know, $2 for this battery. Well, for two dollars, and what you're telling me, the compromises, you're not gonna get the performance you need. So you're gonna end up losing something in your product's performance if you're doing it that way. So, so that's basically a quick summary of basically what works. How how this when we come into the formula, what we ask and how we work with the customer to help them get and design a, the right battery solution for them. Um, the next few slides will be a specific application, a specific project that we went through. But I think before I go, do that, what I would like to do is, if there are any questions about these two or three slides, you know, let me let's cover that before I go to the specific application. Um, so, so you ready for a couple of questions, Harry? Yep. Okay. So there's a couple of them here in the chat box that are actually really good, and we guys, just so you know. We could literally talk about this all day long. <laughs> we could really. So, um, you know, the first one, Harry, that is um, is a great question. Is one of the first questions is what are some of the mis what are some of the common or the biggest one misconceptions that people have about batteries? Uh, well, the, the biggest misconception, you know. Is I will speak specifically to lithium batteries, right? Uh, because I'm not going to speak to other technologies. Mm -hmm. um, biggest misconception is, well, lithium is all the same. And it's not. They're not. And there's so many, so many variations of lithium out there today. Um, we deal, for us, specific, specifically for PhD, we only deal with the mature technologies. And the mature technologies today are your... Basically, the LCO, which is a lithium co cobalt, and then you have the NMCs, lithium nickel manganese. You got the LFP, lithium iron, and then the LTO. So those are the main four that we deal with because they're mature. They've been out in, in production for a while, and we can easily provide solutions. They, they each have their advantages and disadvantages. High energy, depending if you're looking for higher energy density versus long cycle life versus highest safety right um cost you know so those are all make a difference and we can take even within each family we can manipulate the chemistry to improve certain aspects of the battery right so if you say you know i need better discharge performance at lower temperature we could tweak the chemistry to get you a little bit better to performance but then it's a compromise you lose something you know, maybe on the high end, high high temperature side of it, right? Your high temperature performance may drop, but that may not be as important to you as the low temperature performance. So, and then for example, LFP, you get, you know, 2000 plus life cycles. They, you know, they have lower discharge rates. LCO, which is the cobalts, give you the highest energy densities, right? Your phones, pretty much all cell phones use LCO because that's the highest energy density. They, there's no compromise there, you know, in, on the, you know, energy density by going with LCO, but you compromise, they're not as safe as the NMC and obviously as the LFPs. You can't use LFP because that's half the energy density of LCO. You know, nobody in the cell phone industry is going to use that because it makes no sense. You know, you're not, you, we already complain about our phones don't last long enough. So if you go with an LFP, that's not going to work for you. So that's the biggest misconception. Most people think that all lithiums are the same, but they're really not. And also how they're structured makes a difference. The same chemistries in a, let's say, cylindrical shape versus a pouch, you get different variations of performance um, just because you can pack more into a, a, a cylindrical metal case than you could in a pouch, right? So you get slightly higher energy density when it's packed for as an NMC, for example, in, in 18650, which is the most common size out there, 
we can get higher energy density in a cylindrical 18650 for the same amount of raw materials than we could in a pouch because you could pack a lot more density into a, a metal casing than you could in a soft pouch. So that that's to me is the biggest misconception, that assumption that they're all the same when they're not. Okay, so here the next the next question, um, I'm going to merge a couple to a couple of these questions together because they're similar, and yeah. then I'm going to let I'm going to run through and let other people ask their questions. But so this two questions here, but I'm gonna, I know the answer is going to be really similar. So the first question, the way it's worded, and then I'll tell you the second one. And you can combine your answer. Can you talk about the lifespan of various battery types? I think you started a little bit, but can you talk about the lifespan of various battery types? How many charge discharge cycles can they support if rechargeable? It seems many IoT devices are limited by their battery lifespan. And then the second one, I think this you can answer them both the same. I think it covers both questions address similar answers. Um, the next question from Brian Richardson says, IoT devices are often dormant for long periods of time followed by short bursts of activity that require significant power from the battery. Do you have solutions optimized for these scenarios? I think they're really similar. Um, you know, you could probably answer them in the same okay. way. Um, and I know we've had many calls with many customers about both of those questions and they seem like the same answer. Okay, no problem. So again, yeah, so th this is, it's not a simple thing that I can, I'm gonna give you, um, an answer that's going to probably cover you, you know, because we need to ask a lot more detail about you to, to customize it. But I would say this way, lithium batteries have a self monthly self discharge rate, even if they're sitting by on, on their own. Right. So, and depending on the chemistry, it varies uh, from 2% to five to 6%. Also the temperature they are stored makes a difference, right? It, it could go higher if you're at higher temperatures. So the self discharge rate goes up you know, when, when you're closer to the higher end of your operating temperature. So 2%, I believe LFPs are around 2%. When you go to the other chemistries, you're in the 5% range monthly. So you have to, number one, account for that. And that's not including what your circuitry drain is, right? So you got to get that accounted as well. Your device is going to have its own current drain that it'll draw from that. So that's basic. You have to account for that. Uh, in terms of charge and discharge cycles, again, different chemistries have different parameters. Um, LFP, like I mentioned earlier, you get 2,000 plus. And NMCs, nowadays, we're getting NMCs up in the 1,000 cycles, right? Charge and discharge cycles. However, that, that charge and discharge cycle is can be tweaked and improved on by controlling your maximum charge voltage and then the minimum discharge uh, voltage limit, right? So so here's where, you know, it gets a little bit tricky. And, and, you know, as we have more discussions, you know, more specific discussions, we have to understand how much power you need. You know, if the battery is giving has, is spec much higher than what you need, then you can lower that your maximum charge and, you know, minimize the capacity delivered because you actually have more energy in the battery than you need. But what that's going to do is extend your battery life cycle, charge and discharge cycle. We call that the life cycle more, right? You could easily go on a, you know, on a LFP from 2000 to 4000 cycles. For example, an LFP is a 3.65 volt on the high end. If you charge it to about 3.5, you could easily go to 4000 cycles on an LFP. So you double basically the life cycle and charge is worse than the discharge, right? The actual, the maximum charge voltage, charging has more negative effect on the battery than discharging does. So, so the, the harder, faster you charge a battery, the higher voltage, you, know, you, you try to peak the maximum peak voltage, has more negative effect than actually the bottom end of it, where you say, oh, I'm going to discharge it to three volts normally, but what if I do 3.1 or 3.2? That has less of an effect. It does have some, but it's much less than what your maximum charge voltage does the charging is always worse than the discharging on the battery hmm. it's kind of absolutely right. the worst thing you can do to a battery unfortunately it's not necessarily <laughs> evil but it's it's one of the worst things you can do to batteries charge them and uh, what else is there i think I... okay so harry so we have another one actually so i saw those two that i thought were similar answers yeah. so from here now i'm gonna let the people ask the questions themselves so stephen morris you have a question here um, about different technologies of battery. Do you want to ask that question? 
Yeah, thank you. I've been reading about uh, the company NDB. It's a startup in California, and they claim that they are developing a nuclear um, waste-based uh, battery that will last 28,000 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you might want to get out of the lithium business. Yeah. <laughs> 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 How do you recycle that one? <laughs> so what can you tell us about that? Anything? Well, obviously there's a lot of, I mean, you've got, you got hydrogen batteries, you know, there's, there's a lot of development stuff around. And as I said, in the earlier stages of my conversation here, we deal with mature project products today, mature solutions. All the stuff there's there's even solid state batteries today out there, you know, the being developed, which eventually we will bring that into our lineup as well. We just don't have it because they're at development stage. And you know, when something is in development, they're five plus years out into being introduced into the market. So, you know, I'm I'm not gonna worry about something that's gonna be five years out when almost everybody I speak with, most of the clients, they're in they're in a hurry to get their stuff out in the next three to four months. So I'm not, it makes, you know, nobody cares that something is going to be out there available in five years or 10 years, you know, and most of these, even, even uh, like I said, the, the these uh, solid state batteries, there's few factories manufacturing them, very limited. They have a lot of limitations and, and nobody can produce in high volume, right? When, when it comes to volume production, mature production, there's no good solution out there. They're, they're very limited. And, and if you go and say, yeah, I need a million pieces a month, they will freak out, you know? So that's, it, it, they just, get <laughs> those standards. and that's, a, that's a, you know, for anybody that wants to produce product, you know, that's a problem. Nobody wants to hear things like that. You want to be able to select a solution and be able to buy it right away, not wait, you know, for two years for a company to get their R and D, done and set up and be able to run you know set up manufacturing for you that's not that's not nobody's nobody that we deal with is in that group right everybody's i need my product yesterday right and most people we speak with they want the stuff yesterday or as soon as possible so they can get launch their products and make money so yes there's a lot of viables like i said you know what you mentioned is is a you know something it could be viable it could be a solution that works but until they have in in mass production and they can show they can repeatedly produce product repeatedly, which is a lot harder than most people think it is. You know, producing something, you know, in five pieces is not the same as producing the same thing, meeting the same spec for millions of pieces. It's completely different animal. And there's a, you know, that's why there's manufacturing and production engineers. That's all they focus on. How can I make a gadget, you know, that, that somebody can make by hand 10 pieces or do a small run of 10, 20 and make millions of this and have them all meet the same standard, same specification. So that 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 is a, a, an issue with most R&D products. And yes, of course, some of them will succeed, but if anybody deal with R&D, you know about only about maybe 10% of what you develop makes it through. So 90% goes to waste, whether it's for financial reasons or for technical reasons, right? So I would say, we we focus mainly on mature products and we will sit and you know we always keep our ears and eyes open for new technologies out there you know to me the next one that probably will come into our mix of solutions will will be the solid state battery because that's the that's the closest to being mature at this point you know we think that will be ready in about a couple of years where we can bring that in as a as a solution that we offer to our clients but even that until now we don't we don't have a viable um, solution that you know i could say oh here's a good lineup of products out there or i can customize for you what you need and be able to go into production and produce you know 50 hundred thousand pieces a month for you you know if i can't say that uh to me it's it's not uh it's not viable for the market yet can you comment on the projected lifetime of the uh, solid state battery the solid state batteries at this point the numbers are are varying but it, it's projected to have Fairly, you know, I'm seeing numbers from like thousand to you know a few thousand cycles on it. But again, it's very early. It's it's it depends on your how you you know how you use it up. How you you know if you're gonna 
put it in a system where it's stressed a lot, obviously stress is going to degrade the battery, right? But if it's not, it's going to last a long time. And um, so it really depends on, on the stress level that you introduce to the battery. But they're very safe. That's that the one of the key things on the solid state is there of all the, what's available out there, they will be the safest, absolute safest of the, the current the four technologies that we have. Great. So so Stephen, you have another really great question you wanna about the iPhone or the, about the Apple. <laughs> you wanna ask that one really quick before we move sure. on to the next one, because everybody's gonna laugh about that. <laughs> there really should be a better Batteries, um, and I know we're trying to cram everything in them. We're trying to improve performance and so on. So we want we want more of everything, including a smaller form factor. Yeah. Um, but are you surprised at how well the batteries are in the iPhones or the phones in general, or do you think they could be better? What's your perspective on that? You know, the phone the phone guys spent a lot of um, money. I mean, they have you know teams of hundreds of engineers, right, focusing on the battery technology. It's very important for them, right? I mean, you know, this, this, this use time, you know, especially before we used to say talk time, but today it's not really talk time, it's pay, game time, right? Most people spend time gaming on their phones or browsing, right, or, you know, whatever, whether YouTubing or whatever it is, that eats up a lot of processor, processor time, right, that, you know, from the battery. And... The harder you're driving these processors and the faster they're becoming, right? All the latest gen of processors out there, they're, they eat up more battery. The, you know, the, the faster they are, the faster they, you know, scoop up energy from the battery. So what you see is actually if you've got an iPhone, not just an iPhone, a Samsung, whatever else, mm -hmm. you know, if you're using it, if you're playing games on it or if you're watching, you know, Netflix or whatever else, you you could see it warming up, right? Because it's just the processors working up, working so fast, it's eating up so much energy that it's heating up. And the big, I think their biggest problem is how do they take that heat out from the, you know, from the device to keep the battery at a reasonable temperature? I mean, that's to, to them, it's not necessarily a capacity issue or performance of the cells themselves, uh, because I believe they're getting probably the best solutions out there for the volumes they're buying, but it's, their biggest concern is how do I dissipate all that heat out of my system so that I don't start out with a 5,000 milliamp hour battery and then within the first month, it's down to 2,000, right? Because I've, I've overheated it so much during the first month of usage that it dropped, it degraded so rapidly. Degradation is a key thing, right? And, and if you can minimize degradation, you can extend the useful life and the usage life, right? The capacity life or the energy that the battery delivers to you. <laughs> And that, that's to them, typically that's their challenge, I think, for phone manufacturers is to dissipate that heat from such a small device and how you dissipate it, right? You don't want to get, you don't want to create hot spots, you know, where customers holding the phone and they stop burning their finger, right? Because it's getting so hot in certain places, you know, where the heat is dissipating. So there's a lot of challenges of dissipating heat out of, out of systems like that, very compact and hard, you know, energy burning systems that, you know, it, it, it drives, it drives their, you know, it drives them crazy. And that's why they have such big teams of, of that just look at things like this. I mean, they, they investigate, obviously batteries, key. you know, the safer battery is going to behave better, but safe and degradation are two different things. Just because the battery is safe doesn't mean it doesn't degrade, right? So when you expose, you, you overdrive it, you overheat it, you overcharge it, you're going to degrade the battery. Any battery, I don't care what, what it is, any, any energy system, right? You, you overdrive them you degrade them. Degradation is a physics that you cannot avoid, right? And, and if you degrade them, the performance drops. And when, when the performance drops, how fast that performance drops depends, you know, how hard you're degrading the battery. So, and that, that's something that the system designer has to focus about, right? You get, you got guys that specialize in thermodynamics and, you know, on how to get heat out of your system, how quickly, and there's a lot of materials out there I've used some, some, you know, heat conductive silicones and other, you know, other fancy, you know, materials, you know, that, that improve on dissipation of heat. And, and that's going to help, help the, the drive the, your system. Great. So we have a bunch more questions, but Hans, you had a question here that you want to ask that one. Yeah. So on one of your slides, you have the um, certifications. 
So how much do these vary from industry to industry? So for example, if I started with the consumer device and decide, okay, I'm gonna now make this uh, medical device as well. Yeah. Like, are there overlapping things that are done or is every single time you have to go through the whole yeah, process again? There, there are, there are some, some overlapping parameters, uh, but there are also other that, that are very specific to an industry, right? Um, so medical versus automotive, they care about two different things, right? So on the medical, their high safety is the is basically the safety is the biggest thing, right? It, and redundant safety. They, there's a lot of redundant safety features in medical products, right? Because you you know, especially for products that are that kind of are considered class three medical products, right? Where they the life savings or it could it could affect person's human life if they fail. So there's a lot of redundant safety built built in to every design. And when when they do the safety certification, your battery has to fall in line to those requirements. So the, the requirements, safety requirements for that is much higher. When you get to automotive, for example, you've got safety, but you've got these higher temperature variations, right? So there's a lot of things that change from industry to industry. And you know, at cell level, there's there's a common standard, which is the 1642. That's the most basic standard certification is for at a cell level. Everything, everything. If you take this kind of tree, tree thing, at the base is the UL1642 for the cell. You got to start with UL1642 for a cell. And then from there on, it branches out to all these different pack level certifications, right? So 2054 for basic consumer products. And then you got the, you know, IEC 6213. And there's a few others for, you know, for each industry, there's multiple levels of certifications that you have to do. The costs are different, the times for the, are different for testing because the t number of tests that have to be conducted are, are different. But typically, I would tell customers, you know, plan on a, at least 10 to 12 weeks for certification, at least. That's per certification? Or... In, in, it depends on how... Oh, you know, just certain in general. Certs, yeah, certain certs could be done in parallel, but cert, some cannot. Like, a, you got to get UL 1642 done before you do a the next level pack level certification, right? And the UL 1642 takes about six weeks. And then the next level, if it's another six weeks or eight weeks, then you, you got to accumulate, right? You got to aggregate effect here. So six plus whatever, eight, you got 14 weeks just in certification. But if you're, the cell is already 1642 certified and we have some like standard sizes are already like a cylindrical 18650s usually are pre-certified because they're common then you save that time from your schedule. But if custom batteries, pouches, and things like that, they're not. And you have to, you know, you got to plan on getting a 1642 done if you need to. Now, I would say this, it, nothing is mandatory in the United States. So this is a little caveat. There is no such thing as, as, as a required by law. None of these are required by law. These are all requirements by customers, right? By your, you, your customers and their customers and by the insurance agencies that cover you, right? Great. Great. So, so Harry, we've got about five more questions here, but okay. um, I think you should, I think you should move on to your next slides in your case study here so that we okay. um, don't go over too long. And, yeah. um, and of course, Harry's email address is in the, the, yeah, the top if, of the chat please, If I didn't answer your questions, you got my email, you're welcome to, you know, reach out to me by email. So, I'm, so we'll I'll, see how much time we have left. Yep. So I'll go, go you know, this is a specific example, you know, for, from a customer. And, you know, as you can see, basically, the application here is, is remote telemetry backup system, backup power, right? So this is a device that gets installed out in the field, you know, in the desert, Nevada, whatever, Arizona desert out there. And, you know, they don't want to spend the money to run power line to, you know, to where this, this is set up. They, they've got a portable generator somewhere set up, you know, to run, you know, the product, they whatever device they're they're running, whatever operation they're running, and they want to be able to use the battery as a backup in case when the generator shuts down, for example, right? So it'll charge up from the generator or from a solar panel uh, that they set up on site. So it's a remote, remote telemetry. Um, here's some of the basic environmental conditions. It's outdoor, possible some sun shield, right? They, they said you may possibly be able to put a shield over it to protect it from direct sunlight. Provide shading. 
right? And again, minus 10 to 65C is the range. And, and uh, one of the requirements, right, does need to handle 70C for short periods, you know, of less than one hour. So this was something that, that was a requirement that they wanted to have. And, uh, and again, for it to be justifiable, it, it had to operate seven plus years in the field because they didn't want to send maintenance people. The maintenance guy costs more than the battery pack, right? So it didn't make sense for them to set it up and run maintenance guys, you know, in two or three years to go back there and replace it or repair it. So it had to operate seven plus years out in the field for it to be financially viable for them to go with the solution. Um, didn't really have much of physical limitations. You know, it's got to fit in a six by six standard enclosure, plastic enclosure they were buying. You know, it would have been nice, they said, if it can fit in the six by six, but they could expand to bigger one if necessary. So this was a soft limitation on the, on the size. And then obviously they needed to have the input and output wires, you know, a certain length to make it easy to install into, you know, whatever drop-in box or enclosure that they're gonna install it in. In, in terms of operating parameters, again, they did wanna have, they, they had dual input sources coming in. One was a solar panel, you know, could be a solar panel, 12 or 24. The other one is a, basically a power supply that's running off a generator, right? It's taking from 110 off a generator and, and it's going to a 24 volt power supply that's rated to 60 watts. So that was the limit that we had this working condition that we had to work with. And, you know, they said, we got to charge within four to six hours, right? They don't want either because it's, they just don't want this to be charging for a long time. They want to make sure that the battery was always available in case the generator fuel, fuel runs out or whatever happens. And they want to make sure that it's charged within a short, fairly short period of time for them. And uh, the one thing they did want to have, because this was going to go into different fields, different sites, and the conditions could be different, there would be different clients. They want to have the output sleep in mode, and they want to have that to be adjustable, programmable, because they didn't know some customers may want, um, you know, this thing to turn on and off, you know, every 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Others say, you know what, no, I only want it to turn on once an hour for two seconds burst and go to sleep to conserve energy, right? So they, but they don't know what they're gonna get into. So they said, we'd like it to be programmable, adjustable, right? So that we could cater that to the, each individual customer. And everything had to be built in. Everything had to be built in. So they, they, didn't, they really were not in the battery business. They didn't know anything about batteries, right? So they said, you gotta give me everything in the box. All I need is team, two wires that say input that can take my 24 volts, two wires that say output, that's gonna connect to my device and it's gonna power it up. That's all they wanted to do. They didn't wanna do anything else outside of that. So that means all the charge control, all, all temperature monitoring, all controls, everything had to be built into the product because they don't wanna, they had no idea anything about batteries. They just can give us the basic parameters. And then the one, one other thing is they said, we'd like to pass the input power to the output when battery is not charging, right? So they, they, they want to minimize the usage of the battery when there was available input power, reserve power, right, out there. Um, basic operating spec, right? Input 12 to 24, output 24 volt DC, 625, 0.6, 625 mA continuous, but they wanted 1.25 amp peak. They said we could have one point double basically that at, in peak current. Ripple less than 200 millivolts. And again, operating time minimum two hours under all conditions, under full load basically, right? So they wanna make sure the battery can survive minimum two hours under full load conditions. So these were kind of the parameters given to us to start, right? This was done way before they, they had their system together because they needed this battery to do these things for, for them to design the system around it. So they came back to us with this and Really, this is what we ended up doing for them. So again, this is just a brief of the information, customer requirements, and you know what we do. First thing we do is obviously system system design for them, and go over this with their people. So it had. I'm gonna zoom this in into the little areas because it just makes it easier to see the individual. Oops, oh, let me undo this. Sorry. 
Here we go. All right. So in, at the system level, basically what we designed for them is a, pro, a battery pack that had an input buck boost converter because we really did in a week. We made this even more flexible for them. Uh, so we built it with a buck boost converter. We had um, an external MCU programming connector that hooks up to a, a, a USB driver on your laptop. And, and what we did is we gave them subroutines that they will, you know, and each subroutine control the timing cycle. And you can see that this is an example of a timing cycle where it turns on for X minutes or second, whatever time base on, and it's sleep or Y time base. And, and we basically pro pre-program these subroutines for them and send it to them. And they would install these in based on the customer needs. Um, and the battery pack, obviously you have the battery pack itself here, 40 watt hours, two S1P configuration. We had a protection circuitry built in. You had charge control coming in off the input, but at the same time, we basically provide a bypass out to the output from the power supply. And you can see we had a built-in DC to DC regulator for them with a gate control. So this allowed basically MCU built-in controller to turn this on and off to meet their timing, time base, output time base control function. So, you know, so everything that they asked for basically worked. And, and these are the specs that we ended up providing to them. Now, I won't say it every time we can meet everything you ask for, right? And we came, you know, we came close to pretty much, pretty close to everything they asked in this case. So, you know, again, input 10 to 24 volt, it could accept a solar input, it could accept, you know, and provide you 24 volts, 30, 30 watt hour system, uh, minus 20 to 65 C on the discharge, minimum output 10 watts, you know, size dimensions wise, we were able to fit into the form factor they had. We had charge control five hours and it, we control the charging from zero to 50 C. Um, it, typically we would do 45, but because this was outdoors, we, turned, we made it into 50 C, um, but the charge rate was low enough in this case that we could do that. So, but typically if you have a high charge rate, we don't, we recommend 45C to be the higher temperature cutoff for higher charge rates. But this was a, a much lower charge rate, you know, for, for this battery capacity that we had in, in terms of the C rating, what we call the C rating. So we were able to do that for them. So again, what we did here, because they wanted this life out there, not only life cycle, but the seven plus years. So we cut, we cut the charge maximum charge voltage to 3.55. So typically this is an LFP pack, LFP solution. LFP is typically 3.65. Instead of charging to 3.65, we're charging the battery to 3.55 volts. And then what that basically allows us is, you know, again, we specify 2000 plus here, seven years, but it's, it's actually the actual life cycles that you get at this charge limit is 3000 plus cycles. Um, and, but it will also ensure that they get the ten, seven plus years useful life out of the battery because you're not degrading the battery as much when you're charging it. It extends that. In terms of the minimum discharge is 2.8, which is typical for a, we didn't have to mess around with that. that was, that's a standard you know, minimum cutoff for a LFP battery. And the output status obviously is programmable for various on off and sleep mode conditions through the, through the USB interface that we did. And that's basically what the product looked like at the end of the day. You know, it's they get the little pack with programming wires and your main input and output cables. In their case, they wanted tinned and stripped because electricians will wire this into a system. So they like they like tinned and stripped wires. And it's easy for them to put wire nuts on it. And that's basically what we provided to them. And so it was a drop in you know, to them. It was a simple drop in. They would program these at their home office. They ship them out to the field. Once they're in the field, the electrician will take it. Everything is labeled clearly, which are your inputs, which are your outputs. The color coding is based on their existing system wiring. So it matches up the blue and the red is for their power. And then, you know, the white, I'm sorry, the white and blue is for their input and the red and black is for their output systems. So we match their existing system color codes, color scheme. So it was very easy for their installers to know exactly what the input, what the outputs were. That was it. So they, you know, they put these things out. They did a trial. They loved it, and they, you know, they they start getting more and more requests coming in because it worked. They didn't have to do really anything. All they did is bring it in, 
upload the program if they needed to. In most cases, the basic routine that we put in was was the common one they used. You know, 80% of the business was wake up every, you know, every hour, turn on for two seconds, go to sleep, you know, and, and then that was it. So uh, that routine was built in and that's what they sell most of the time. And really, so it, it basically worked. This is a fairly complex, yeah, obviously, I showed this today because it has a lot of features in it. Typical battery packs, battery solutions don't have as many, you know, we, we rarely do programming, you know, in, in most cases you have one product it's going into and you know what your requirements are and that, you know, we don't need to do that. You do that on your side of the system. But in this case, we did that, you know, in terms of MCU control of the operation, having DC input, DC output and charge regulation, you know, this had everything, all the bells and whistles of a, of a full system, you know, that, that was needed. So it was, for me, I wanted to show this just so you can see how complex it can get. But at the same time, for you, it's easy to see how simple it could be. A simple battery pack could just be the battery cells and the PCM, right? And you get, you basically out from that. And that's as simple as it can be. And as complex as something like this, it could be even more complex in certain robotics where we have master and slave kind of battery pack systems where, you know, you, you want to be able to replace battery. You know, you have two battery packs on the robot and you want to be able to hot swap the batteries, what we call hot swapping. So you want to have a master and slave, you know, communication link between them. So it knows when, when you're trying to swap a battery to disconnect that, disconnect power to it. So you're able to replace that without turning off power to the robot, right? So there's, it gets, we, so there's some complex, more complications that we add to the system, you know, when it gets to, you know, different applications. But that's basically, you know, this gives you a quick view of the process. You know, you get our inputs, we do a system design, obviously, that we do a schematics and all that stuff, but you get a spec from us and then we deliver a product that kind of does what, what we agreed on. Awesome. That's great, Harry. And then, you know, this is a super complex one. And then you've, we've worked on projects with wearables and medical devices, um, all different types of consumer devices, all kinds of different things. But so we we're kind of running out of time, but we've still got a lot of questions. So, I'm kind of scrolling through the chat box to see who's still here. We've lost a few people. Um, Greg, you have a question. Do you want to go ahead and ask that? I think it's just mostly around the agility of the ability uh, against the timeline of a prototype. So if you're building a prototype and you go to a battery manufacturer and you want to get a specific battery, what does that look like from just the amount of back and forth you can do during the prototyping phase? So, yeah, so there's – the answer to that is that, you know, when – is different depending on what kind of battery, what type of battery we, we select for your design. If it's a pouch battery, which is a customized, um, it, it's more difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Because typically we can manage, we can build about 10 to 20 samples, handmade samples, what we call handmade samples in our, in our sample room. Um, beyond that, and then we need to, if, if, let's say if the dimension, the size that we selected is something that we have a tool for existing tool, then we can make prepare samples, you know, off tool, um, and then from there go to mass production. But if we don't have a tool, then obviously once we make a handmade sample, and the customer says, "Yeah, this is what I need. It works well." And just so you know, handmade samples don't perform to all the specifications, right? They've got their downside to certain things, but they'll give you a pretty good idea, confidence level that yes, this works for me, and let's go to tool, and we make the battery tools, I see. and then we can make off tool samples. But so, but bet between all that stuff, you got to understand manufacturing is made for high volume runs, right? So any, any, any run over 20 pieces, let's say anything, 100 pieces or more has to be done on a manufacturing floor. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to set up a manufacturing line and build 100 or 200 pieces and stop, right? right? The overhead right. is so massive that it, it costs too much money. So, but we allow, we, we can allocate certain bandwidth to building smaller runs and what we ask customers say, look, give us your development schedule. Let me know beyond this first 10 pieces or 20, 10 made pieces. What are you gonna need for your EVTs, DVT, DVT1, DVT2? If you say, oh, you know what? I'm gonna need maybe a 50 for my EVT. I may need a hundred for my DVT1, another 150, 200 for my PVT. That's four, 500 pieces. We build that as one batch, right? 
instead of we because we cannot build 50 100 100 it just doesn't right. it's just not feasible but for cylindrical cells not a problem those are evergreen products 18650s are being produced in millions of pieces a month so I have no problem to pull, you know, 10 or 20 at a time from existing runs mm -hmm. and provide you samples. But that can't be done on a shape or, you know, or pouch type batteries. Got it. And as a follow up, are there software emulators? I'm sorry? Can, are there software emulators that can emulate the battery lifespan that are worth anything? Or do you no. really have to get the physical battery in place? Before you, you you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to. I mean, some of it we can give you some of our ex expertise, background knowledge on this, and let you know roughly what you should expect. Others is we run tests. Other times we run tests. You know, you can run it yourself, or we could run some tests for you mm -hmm. based on your parameters to tell you basically, you know, what your expectations should be for in terms of battery life. Okay, great. Thank you. Great question. You're so, so let's see here. So, um, Hans, how much time do we have? How much? When do you want to cut us off here? Yeah, we it was scheduled for ninety minutes, so we have half okay. an hour, so we can. Okay, um, great. Yeah. So, Cody, you have quite a few questions here. Do you want to you want to ask some, or pick one, or a couple, or I'll let you run with what you want to ask him. Oh, you're on uh, silent. We can't hear you. Let's see. Is Cody still here? Yeah, he's still here. Okay, yeah. But I can't hear him. Can anybody else hear him? Yeah, so he's saying just skip over him. Maybe, uh, have we yeah. covered all the questions? John? Oh, okay. Uh, Ryan had a question. Let me get back to it here. Uh, let's see, so Cody had a question. He had a few, so we're gonna skip over that. Oh, he's Hi. having some. This is Brian Richardson. Could I follow up a little bit on my? Go for it. Yep. Yeah. Is that okay? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I asked the one about, um, Sort of energy usage so a lot of these iot devices are basically dormant for you know a long period of time it could be actually weeks or even longer but yep. even uh yeah even if it's a day and essentially you know with very very low current consumption almost zero in some cases yep. um and then suddenly you know, the device has to wake up and transmit and uh yeah send its information be it location or wherever it's monitoring and I wondered about, uh, I, I think I read something somewhere about uh, a solution that sort of combined batteries and SuperCat so that essentially the SuperCat would bolster the, the current uh, capability of the battery uh, during those short transmission times um, and, and would then recharge slowly over a period of time from the battery during the dormant period. So that way you could end up with a much smaller battery, um, hopefully something that was more optimized to the very low current period and then had the, say the super cap to help it connect yeah. um, you know when it needed to yes yes it's yeah so there are you know there are batteries in that primary batteries so what are we talking about some a lot of these iot devices that are disposable ones right um yeah. utilize primary batteries and yeah. there's a couple of technologies for primary batteries that are common you know lithium manganese uh, is is one of them, but um, you know lithium. Uh, I can't remember that for the life of me the name of the other one. I'm, I'm, but you know there's for sensor for sensor use. You know these batteries don't like primary batteries don't like high discharge rates. They're really prone to high discharge rate. Yeah. And you're right. There's there's certain times where they use capacitor high. You know whether you use a standard capacitor depending on your load current right and how close are you to to the battery's performance. Or super caps, you know, and and that that basically helps with these high discharge effects rates coming and affecting the battery, um, and you can you got to look at your cost factor. Sometimes we can we may be able to put a couple of two two three batteries in parallel to kind of be able to overcome that. Other times you could use a, a super cap to over or a standard cap to overcome that. So I think that becomes a one is a financial decision. What will be the cost of adding a suka up to a single battery? And what's the cost of maybe putting two batteries that may do the job, right? And and then the dimensions, the spacing, right? You know, do you have space? Yeah, I think size is important as well sometimes. Yeah, so it, it, does the extra super cap take more space than an additional battery cell? Or two cells are still smaller than one cell plus a super cap, right? Or mm -hmm. a, another cap. So you got to look at these things, you know, cost and space yes. limitations. But absolutely, just like they do, you know, you know, they do this in speakers, right? Where they put a capacitor to drive, 
you know, speakers because, you know, because your power supply cannot deliver the full load current and use capacitors to do that. It's the same thing. We use that to compensate, you yeah. know, the, 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 the negative part of the, of the primary batteries, you know, that that's, we do have though, you know, in recent days, I would say it, with it, within the last year, we have developed uh, lithium manganese uh, primary batteries that could do up to one C discharge rate, which in the past have been mainly about 0.3 to 0.4 C. So we yeah. do have primary batteries that can handle one C discharge rating. And uh, typically it's, it's point, like I said, in the 0.5 or under, right? But uh, we do, we, it, but it's only pouch type. So there, there's a price yeah. difference. You know, it's a pouch type solution. I can deliver one C discharge rating. So that helps again. It becomes a numbers, right? You know, is is the cost of this one cell, and sometimes maybe the like you said, dimension makes a difference. Hey, it's got to fit there, and if this fits and the combo other combos don't, then cost becomes secondary, right? Because it's a solution that works. Sure. Great. So um, awesome. Thanks, Harry. So Cody's back. So Cody, if you're up. You want to go ahead and ask your questions. Where'd he go? He's still on mute. Cody. Yeah, yeah, it shows you're muted. So we... <laughs> okay. He said he just switched over. He's still having problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Maybe we can we can answer. I mean, let's yeah. can read the questions. Okay. We can. I can write. Okay, it. let's see here. Um, I'm gonna go to the top. He's got quite a few here. Um, so I'm just gonna. I'll ask. I'll, I'll ask the first one. I'm, um, do we do you work with any customers that delve into previously used rechargeable batteries or looking at more sustainable long term plans for batteries? What types of considerations would you make in these situations? So normally, no, I would say usually we're dealing with a lot of new product development. It's It's rare. Um, just because the technologies are changing so fast these days, most companies don't take old systems and try to upgrade them, you know, because if you do that, you're already changing all your electronics, you know, you might as well, you know, when you do new, your new electronics designs, you're going to probably want a battery that works with your new electronics, you know, with your new processes, whatever else you're putting on there. So typically that's not the case. Typically when it's a battery, when they're coming to us with a battery problem, it's because their current battery doesn't work. They don't understand why it's not working, why it doesn't fit their application. And then we coming in and giving them an alternate solution that fits the bill basically of what they need. But it's not there. Typically it's not, oh, I'm using a, a NICAD. It, you know, can you bring, can you show me a, a, a lithium that can take the place of that? It's, it, it's rarely that. Okay. okay, what else? Let's see here. Um, Cody also asked the question, does the MCU also have a real-time clock? That, that the, the design that I showed, yes, it does. Okay, I think this is regarding that. Um, and then another one, also wondering with the specifications, did you determine um, the enclosure to use, I'm sorry, um, determine the enclosure to use and or do you do that? Uh, mainly wondering because of ventilation exhaust of the device potentially in the sun. I yes, think that's so, probably where you just yeah. work with your customer so, on that, right? Yeah. Again, we're we're not we're not thermodynamic experts, um, so it's typically that's something that the customers should do themselves because I'm not going to become an expert for every mm -hmm. application that they can have. But in general, we will give you some guidelines, right? We if we if you can show us how you plan to build this stuff, put it together. You know, we will come back and say, look, you need to account for, you know, th there's things that you have account for, like swelling in, in certain situations, right? Mm -hmm. And then the heat, obviously heat is a big factor, right? So typically, mm -hmm. you know, we recommend that you put the battery where it's going to see the most ventilation, right? You know, you're, you don't want to put it in, you know, in the top or where all the heat accumulates, you know, on, in, in a box where it's on the, 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 the top end of the box where you're going to get the hottest, right? Obviously. Put it at a lower end of the box where it's cooler, right? Temperature yeah. goes up, cool goes down, right? So common sense says put it, a, put it, ne you know, don't put it next to heat sinks, obviously, right? If you have heat sinks, keep them away from your heat sinks, right? Keep them away from your power electronics where you have components getting really hot, right? You got MOSFETs mm -hmm. that are running 
you know, high current, keep them away from things that are going to get hot and heat the battery. Mm -hmm. So those yeah. are some general guidelines that we will provide, you know, for you, you know, to help you out. But beyond that, you should really do this, your own study and make sure to see mm -hmm. how hot it's getting and, 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 and find the best position, best way. And, and really, and, and, and lithium doesn't matter. Any orientation is not a big issue, right? So you can put them in any orientation. So you, you try to figure out the best way for the battery to be positioned so that you get, you got the coolest spot in your system for the battery. Yeah. And we talked a little bit earlier about this in for mobile phones, right? That's the biggest challenge for them, right? They, they getting all that heat because there's where do you put it? It's, it's everything is so packed, so stacked inside a mobile phone. Right, it, it's it's a it's a big challenge, right, to get heat out and not yeah. and not pass it on to the battery cell. Yeah. So Harry, I want to just say that on one project that you that we've worked on for some time now, um, they you just get the customer, you collaborate with the customer to, to you ask them the right questions, so they think about things like, do you put it in the the under the hood of the car, or is it safer to put it in the trunk? Or you know, yeah. how hot is it going to get in the front or under the back seat? Or as an example, right? So, um, so the collaboration, the questions that you ask from your ex expertise and experience is is great. Um, let's see, Guy, you have a question here. Would you like to ask your question? I think Guy's still here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's probably. A relatively basic question when it comes to battery properties but when i look at uh, different batteries out there and reading their specs what should i pay attention to and how to specifically and how to calculate um how fast i can charge them some sometimes people ask me well can we just charge it faster and i'm guessing obviously you can just have more power and get faster okay. uh, charge yeah so i you know typically a standard specification when we put out there we we really only specify at about 0.5 c rating for charge rate uh, doesn't mean you can't do faster but that's that's kind of standard you know standard spec that we put out there if you need faster you you really need to work with your battery supplier on that question right you need to say guys hey i i, I need to do a, a half hour charge right can this battery do that if not you have a solution that can do that so typically there are chemistries with again within the same within the three or four that I discussed earlier, we could you could tweak the chemistry so you can do a faster charge rate. You can go, you know, there's up to five C charge rating. Um, but when when you do that, again, it's a compromise, right? It, you you increase the charge rate, but the charge temperature window goes down. You can't, you know, to do let's say a three C charge rate. You can only do that between typically 10 to 30 degrees Celsius. You, you will not be able to do that outside of that window. And you have to have good battery temperature monitoring. And also the time period where you could do that fast charge is limited. So typically, you know, if you think of 1C rating means you need one hour to basically, right, to charge your battery. If you do 2C, that's half hour. So 4C, you got, 20, you know, basically a quarter of an hour, 15 minutes. So we're going to limit that you know so when we tell you okay you can do 3c we're going to limit you to 15 20 minutes and you got to have a timer in your charger that'll stop that you cannot just do an open fast rate charging right you cannot just say okay i'm going to crank you know 10 amp into this battery and just check my voltage you can't do that you got to have safety timer built in to shut it off at, at the appropriate time base and and not let it extend beyond that because you run into safety safety issues and when you're doing 4c 5c these higher fast rate charging your battery reaction in terms of negative effects is much faster sometimes you know you have ntcs that are measuring temperature they just can't react fast enough anybody who works with ntcs knows this right it, they're very slow to react so you can't just depend on the ntc to measure your battery temperature say oh it's getting too warm you know let me let me slow down by the time you you reach that conclusion it's too late you probably damaged the battery already just NTCs don't, don't react fast enough to, to the environment around them. So you got to do timers. You got to have a safety timer built in. Say, okay, I'm going to charge it at 2C or 3C for 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to stop. And then obviously the ambient temperature. You can only do it at the, between 10, typically 10 to 30. But for each battery, that, that number shifts slightly. You know, that window can, it could be 15 to 25 in some cases. It could be 10 to 40 in some cases. So that's something that, 
you would have to discuss and and get that signed off you know, really you know by by the battery manufacturer for you to be able to do it gotcha. thank you you're welcome so eric eric you have a question that is is it's a great question i bet everybody wants to know the answer to this one so you want to go ahead and ask your question sure um thanks harry for a great presentation i really appreciate it my you're question welcome. is is uh, is there a difference between actually shutting a battery off for certain types of batteries versus just not drawing any current? Uh, two answers. Um, one is yes, one is no. <laughs> the, the yes answer is it's, you know, if you're going to store, if you don't know how long you're going to have the battery pack in storage, right, on a shelf somewhere, you know, you have, you know, you're selling this through Amazon and Amazon's going to buy, you know, a million of your units and put it on their shelves. You don't know how, when, you know, how long it's going to be on a shelf, how long there's transit time, storage time, right? If you don't know that, it's it's great to have a physical off switch where you completely disconnect the battery from your device, from your system, from everything electrical that could up. So you're basically drawing zero current off of it and you're only dealing with your dis self discharge rate of the battery, right? Because then you know exactly what that is and you, and, and you're minimizing that loss in, in a storage effect. So it helps to have a physical off switch in, in conditions like that. The no answer is if you have if you have a system that's already very efficient and it's drawing, you know, something like, you know, 10 nanoamps, that's probably not and you got a battery that's let's say a thousand milliamp hours on, that's gonna be nothing, right? 10 nanoamps even run that for a month, it's not gonna drain. And and again, but 10 nanoamps for a year is a lot, right? It adds up, right? But 10 nanoamp for a month or two months is probably not going to make big enough dent that you need to worry about it. And you could just go into sleep mode, right? You could, you know, you can, because even the BMS, if we put a protection module, even the BMS that has a drain on the battery, it does drain some current off of it. But then you got your own circuitry that's going to drain as well. So, you know, if, if that drain is low enough and you think, okay, you know what, I can survive this. If, you know, we we can ship pre-charge, obviously, from the factory, but not 100% because the UN, UN 38 uh, requirement is about 30 to 40%. So we could only charge it to that level, ship it out to you. If that's enough, based on the capacity of the battery and the charge level, if you think that could, you know, and you think by the time we, sh you sh we, we ship it, you receive it, you're warehouse gets it and they send it out to customers at three to four month cycle, you're probably going to be okay. But if it's going to be more than that, typically what we tell customers, if it's more than six month cycle, you need to think about maintenance, right? You need or move up to a higher capacity, figure out a way to extend it beyond that. If you could do maintenance, do a maintenance every six months when you're storing the batteries. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see. Any other questions here? I know we're kind of getting tight on Stuart? time. Yeah, I Stuart. have a question about battery chemistry, if I may. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. You know, we've been talking mostly about lithium batteries. Yeah. Um, me and my uh, business partner, we work in robotics, and we're looking at making robots that are roughly the size of a mobility scooter, maybe a little bit smaller. And I know that, like a lot of mobility scooters, you are using lead acid batteries. So. Right. It made me wonder, like, should we be looking at lithium batteries or should we be considering lead acid? And if I can step up, take a step back, the general question would be, like, when should we look at alternative chemistries other than lithium? At this, you know, so for us, we deal mainly in lithium batteries today. And that's really, at this moment, that's that's the only mature, other mature solution out there outside of, you know, obviously NICADs and, and nickel metal hydrides, right? But those those not going to give you the energy densities that you get out of a lithium. Your decision making in, in your case is, uh, is is cost a big factor? If yes, I can't I can't be you know lead acid on pricing. There's no way I can beat. The way the way I have people look into this is, do you need if you're okay with charging your battery for 18 hours a day and using it for four hours, lead acid works for you. But if you if you need to char charge your battery for four hours a day and use it for 18 hours, then lead acid is not going to work for you. You need lithium because you can do that to lithium. You can't do that. You can't fast charge lead acid battery, right? It takes a long time to charge it. So if that's a problem, or you're going to have to buy a lot of lead acid batteries, right? Because you got you, you have heavy use for them, right? 
per day. And and they don't handle. And the other thing, lithium has a flat discharge curve, fairly flat compared to lead acid. Lead acids taper off. So let's say a, a 100 amp hour lead acid battery is is not equivalent to a 100 amp hour lithium battery. You get a lot more energy out of a 100 amp hour lead, lithium battery than you do out of a lead acid, just because the flatness of the curve. Because, you know, your voltage stays up much higher, you know, on a lithium battery. Price-wise today, I would say, in terms of what's out there, it, lithiums are roughly two to three x the cost of lead acid batteries these days. So that that'll, in, in terms of financially, that's that's the number. And if you can live with that, the, in terms of the, oh, if you're looking at cost now, a lead acid is going to win. But if you're looking at cost over the use life of a product, lithium is going to win because you're going to have less maintenance issues with. You're not going to. You don't need to maintain lithium batteries, whereas you need to maintain lead acid batteries. So you got to account maintenance. Maintenance is human involvement, right? Human costs money, right? It's not cheap to have a person go out there and do maintenance on a battery. So that's going to cost you in the long run when you're using lead acid battery. So that fact has to be factored in over the use. If you're doing a, like your cost model for, let's say, five to seven years, if you, I think if you look at that, you're going to find out that the lithium actually costs you less money over the useful life of the product than lead acid does and give you better performance. You know, like I said, LFP, I don't know if you were on earlier, but you know, we do a lot of LFPs. LFP, you can get you know, 2,000 plus cycles on it easily if it's designed right, up to 4,000 cycles on them in, a, in your system. And that's a lot of years you know, nice. out of a battery. That's very helpful uh, information. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. OK, I think we covered all the questions, unless I missed something. Does anybody else have anything they want to ask before we pass it off to Hans to close out? There was So there was one question I was curious about. Uh, okay. I think John is here. Um, he asked, okay. uh, which ecosystem, Apple, Android, Arduino, has most mature BMS? So the. Um, to be honest, I don't know. The B what we do is we design our own BMS. I'm really not sure, you know, mm. of those guys what they what they do for. The they don't. This that's not public knowledge, so I can't tell you, you know, what they they use in terms of how they use their BMS. But you know, you know, what we design BMS is not specific to a, a phone manufacturer or not related to any of these brands. Uh, we design a lot of different BMS. Obviously, there's a lot of chipset manufacturers that have existing solutions that you can use max mti you know and all those guys out there um and and other times we use our own custom right we we, we use a controller to do that work you know it, it gives us more customization you know a lot of the the complex bms's that we build are customized and programmable we 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 program those to do the things that needs to do and especially when there's communication and bus or serial communication that we need to provide to customers you know, those are things that we need to add in, and it just makes it easier when we use a controller-based, custom controller-based solution versus an off-the-shelf. How frequently do you do you have a custom BMS? Oh, it, typically, if I would say I can't give you a number, but typically for like robotics, um, for the, the heavy applications, um, you know, done some forklift batteries. Uh, some mobility stuff, you know, where they're trying to, you know, show consumer fuel gauge information, SOCS, so, you know, and there's communication between the battery pack and the controller that's running the product. You know, there needs to be a lot of communication. We would use a, pro, a custom solution. Okay. It's hard to find off the shelf that does, yeah. you know, everything you need. Right, right. All right, I think that, that was all the questions. Uh, I don't think we missed anything. So I just posted the link again to the air meet. Uh, I'll hang out there until 2 o'clock. Uh, if you want to join me, I just want to have a few people on there to test this uh, tool out um, to hopefully help us with uh, networking mm -hmm. with the future events. So um, if you have some time, uh, feel free to join. And uh, we'll try this thing out. Cool. Okay. Otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, oh, and uh, don't forget to join the Discord server as well. Uh, we've had quite a bit of activity in there, so um, you know, join and uh, connect. Otherwise, hey, Hans, I'll see you guys. 
Hey, Han, sorry. Do you want to put a link on your the Discord server? Do you want to put a link on there for those people that aren't in it already? Yes. Uh, actually, I sent out an email this morning. Okay, cool. That's uh, right. So I would you have did. to go look right. it up and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, I know. It's not quite handy. They they don't do easy. Uh, <laughs> they don't do easy right. URLs. Uh, yeah. So I the, the the email I sent out this morning should have it in there. Um, it's also on the meetup page. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you very much, Harry. This was awesome. I learned a lot. Uh, I didn't even know B what BMS was until this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, these so, nomenclatures are confusing. You know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm familiar with every little two-letter words that people throw at me. But. Yeah, and there were a lot today, but uh, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, you're welcome back. And uh, um, to everyone else, if you want to have follow-on, so one of the things that we talked about with Harry was doing a very high-level broad brush, uh, brush with this. And then if you're interested in going into detail in specific areas, um, we can set up follow-up uh, meetups with him as well. Um, just reach out to me or Jennifer as well, and yep. uh, and we'll get it organized. Uh, but this was really helpful. I think this, yeah, and, and I'm this is awesome. The, and I'm on the West Coast, for those of you who are around. I'm on the West Coast in LA area, right? So I'm Pacific time. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. All I'll right, hopefully everyone. see you all on air meet in a second. Head it over. All right. See you yeah. there. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.